Hello everyone, welcome to IAS Baba's 60 days rapid revision series for prelims 2022. This is day 43 and we take up the agriculture and other topics for discussion. So we are taking up geography today and before going to that, we will have the guessworks. So here in the context of colonial India, Shanavas Khan, Prem Kumar Saigal and Guru Bhak Singh Dilan. So they are remembered as, so friends in all basic books it is given, so it is the INA trials. So here the knowledge comes first and then the guessworks and then Come to next with reference to the Indian history, which of the following statement is or are correct. So Nizamat of Arkut emerged out of the Hyderabad state, so not present in any book. Then Mysore kingdom emerged out of Vijayanagara empire, again not present. And then Rohilkan kingdom was formed out of territories occupied by Amatsha Durani. So Amatsha Durani means Amatsha Abdali. So if you read any book, we will get this. So here, if we had spent some thought process like in the Bengaluru, we have Kempegoda International Airport. So what is this Kempegoda name? So Kempegoda, he was an officer who was in the kingdom of Vijayanagara. So he was an officer in Vijayanagara kingdom. So to that extent, we can say that Bengaluru, Mysuru, so all these region, so they were carved out of Vijayanagara empire. So statement two stands to be correct. So here, if we eliminate others, so the two is present in ABC and now the options one and three, so they have to be checked. So here also options say that Either one or three has to be correct. Both of them, they cannot be correct at a time. And here the Nizamat of Arkut emerged out of Hyderabad state. We don't know. But however, if we have spent some thought process regarding Ahmad Shah Abdali, so just like the Muhammad Ghazni or Muhammad Ghori, so he didn't conquer any kingdoms in India. He just plundered and went away. So to that extent, like some kingdom which is being carved out of that is not a possibility. So it is not a probability at least. So if you take that guesswork, so one and two stands to be the correct answer. Then come to next, which one of the following statement is correct? So Ajanta Caves in Vagora River, Sanchi Stupa Chambal River, and then Pandulani Caves, Narmada River, and Amravati Stupa Godavari River. Friends, here again in the map work, whenever I speak about the map works, so UPSC always clubs two to three topics. So here art and culture is being clubbed with the map work. And if you go with the guesswork, say here, the Chambal, then Narmada, Godavari, so all these are famous rivers, but Vagora is something unique. And here if you see like Sanchi Stupa, so why you should present in one of the main river banks or Pandulani Caves, why it should be present in Narmada river only? Why not any tributaries of Narmada? And Amaravati Stupa, why not any tributary of Godavari? Why this Vagora only? So why not the main river? So most probably this will be the accurate and UPSC examiner, he didn't have time to search for any tributaries and put it here. So in the hurry, he has put some main rivers and thereby he gave us the answer. So if you just have some thought process, we will get this. So this is the maximum possible guesswork. We can do it here. And then the 10th one. So 21st February is declared as the International Mother Language Day by UNICEF. So here mind the UNICEF is the Children's Emergency Fund. So why this children should come into a mother language? So the language is something related to the culture. So UNESCO will come to the maximum extent. So this statement stands to be wrong. Then the demand that Bangla has to be one of the national languages was raised in the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan. So here there are no extreme words. So we can take it as correct. And with the crude knowledge of the history, so we can get to know that. So in the East Pakistan, so the resolution might have been passed. So two will be correct and statement one can be false. So here something if we don't know properly exactly, so we'll consider it as correct and we don't consider it as a wrong statement unless and until we can prove properly that this statement is wrong. So here we proved it wrong, but here let it be right. So that is what I call respect your ignorance. So if you don't know something and if the statement is moderate, so it is the correct statement. Then come to next. With reference to Chausat Yogini temple situated in Morena, consider the following statement. So it is a circular temple built during the reign of Kachapagata dynasty. So we don't know. Then it is the only circular temple in India. So need not be. So there are so many temples which are not yet discovered. So how you can say that it is the only temple. So strike it down and search. So we eliminated two. So that one and four only standard to become the answer. A very simple question. And the lengthy question, so they are the easiest ones here. And even if you go with the knowledge, so this Chausat Yogini was present in Hindu, so you can go with the knowledge or with the guesswork. So the smartness or hard work, either of the things, 
should be there to crack prelims. Then come to next, which one of the following ancient towns is well known for its elaborate system of water harvesting and management by building a series of dams. So here we know that Dalavira was there in news regarding the UNESCO World Heritage Site. So I don't think this question requires a guesswork. So this is a child's play here. And then coming to the topics, the cropping seasons in India. So here we have the Karif crops. So that means from July to October, from the beginning of monsoon, so till the beginning of winter. So in the duration of monsoon, Karif is grown and the harvest happens during the September to October. That is the autumn, we can say. And these are also called as monsoon crops. And crops grown here are like rice, sorghum, maize, etc. And they require a lot of water. So we all know that. And then the Rabi crop. So here sowing between October and November happens. And then the reaping happens in the April-May times. Or even in the February also it can. And these are called the winter season crops. And they need cold weather for the growth. And they need less water. So here wheat, oats. So oats means corn we can say. And barley pulses and others. So these are Rabi crops. And then the Zaid crops. So here sowing between March and reaping in the June. So somewhere in the summers, in the heating summers of North India. So we will expect some juicy vegetables and fruits like the cucumber and then the watermelon and others. So these are the Zaid crops. So here it is like the bottle guards, then the watermelon and then the cucumber are the major crops grown in this season. And then come to next. Friends, how the questions will be asked from these topics? So here it is like with reference to pulse production in India, consider the following statements. So black gram can be cultivated as both Karif and Robbie crop. So now how your brain goes. So your brain goes directly to the book to search whether I have read it as Karif or Robbie. So don't take your brain to the book. So see like it is my field and it is my crop. So who cares whether I grow it in Karif or Robbie season. So go with that approach. So even in India any farmer if he is growing a crop in Robbie season. So will UPSC go and stop them? Cannot. So most probably it will be correct. So anytime it can be grown. So that is left to the farmer. So here other statements are not so important. For me this was important. So have your approach. So that is different from the knowledge you pick up. So that is why that by heart it doesn't work in UPSC. Then come to next the cultivation of sugar cane. So here geographical conditions for the growth. It is a tropical as well as subtropical crop. So it can be grown in north as well as south India. And sugar cane in North India is of the subtropical variety and it has low sugar content. So in the temperate variety, the sugar content is low and sugar cane juice begins to dry up because of the long dry seasons in the North India. So that's why they are not that sweeter. Then sugar cane in South India is of the tropical variety and they have high sugar content. So friends, there was a question in mains that is why the South Indian sugar canes are sweeter than North Indian. So all these answers you will write in mains. Then it grows well in hot and humid climate with a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius to 27 degrees Celsius. So friends, now when the temperature comes, so go to the biomes we have discussed, the temperature line and the precipitation line and apply to that. Okay, so here 21 to 27 is nothing but a normal tropical type of weather and the annual rainfall 75 centimeter to 100 centimeter. So again, it is bit less compared to the tropical. In tropical, we expect 100 centimeters every year. It is not 100, but 75 to 100. And it is a long maturing crop. So it requires some 7 to 8 months. So it cannot be harvested in 4 to 5 months. So this is about sugarcane. Then the paddy. So here the temperature for paddy is 22 to 32 degrees Celsius. So compare that with the sugarcane. That is 21 to 27 here, 22 to 32. So that means bit warmer and humid climate is required for paddy. So this is more a tropical crop than the sugar cane. And then the rainfall around 150 to 300 centimeters. So very high rainfall because paddy requires a stagnant water of two and a half to three feet. So here we can see the stagnant water and then the soil type, the clayey soil and even the loamy soil can suffice, but it should hold water. The soil should not be porous. And India is the second largest producer of rice in the world after China. So remember rice, rice means China first. Then in states like Assam, West Bengal and Odisha, so three crops of paddy are grown in a year. So all the three crops, there is no rotation of crops here. And these are called the Aus, Aman and Boro. So remember this Aus, Aman and Boro. You can always get a question 
house aman and borrow are associated with which of the following so remember these then come to next the wheat so here the temperature is not same so it varies hugely so it might be as high as 26 degrees and as low as 10 degrees so that means it is a crop suitable for temperate climate where in the winter it is having low temperature and in the summer it is having very harsh temperature and here the rainfall is again 75 to 100 centimeters so less than the tropical so even 75 even less than 75 can suffice for this and only during the growing season it requires some water then soil type well drained fertile loamy and clay soil so friends here if you have minimum water so it can grow in any soil so there is no specific soil type for paddy as such and then india is the second largest producer after china again and the success of green revolution so here green revolution made the wheat popular all through the nation so all these are points to be remembered again and then the pulses so here the temperature is at 20 to 27 degrees celsius friends although these are the rain fed crops so they will grow only in dry regions and here the temperature will always be high and also the humidity will be less compared to any other crop so we know that for paddy so again it is that 21 to 27 degrees celsius was required so but here the humidity is absent and the rainfall so it is around 25 to 26 centimeter so very minimum rainfall even compared to wheat so wheat at least requires 75 centimeter pulses not even that then the soil temperature sandy loamy soil so again any soil and india is the largest producer as well as consumer of pulses in the world so remember largest producer as well as consumer and then major pulses grown are the tur dal arhar dal urad moong masur etc so your assignment especially for people for east india south india so go to the internet and check what are the local names for these okay anyway hindi belt so the same names you will learn so others so check it then being leguminous crops so all these crops except arhar help in restoring soil fertility by fixing nitrogen so nitrogen fixation so that will happen by pulses so that is why after wheat cultivation pulses are being grown for rejuvenating the soil fertility then groundnut predominantly it is a karif crop but it is also shown as a rabi crop so actually it requires more water so that is why it is preferred to be grown in karif and this thrives best in the tropical climate and requires 20 to 30 degree temperature and 50 to 75 centimeters of rainfall so again it is very similar to the wheat and pulses so somewhere in between we can say so somewhere in between we can say and then the crop is highly susceptible to frost drought and continuous rain and stagnant water so extremities should never be there so not even extreme dryness and drought and frost and neither extreme rain and stagnant water so remember this fact for groundnut and it needs dry winter at the time of ripening so during the time of ripening dryness should be there just like wheat then rapeseed and mustard so here we can see the mustard how it looks the plant thrives in north and west india more and it's generally grown as rabi crop either purely or it is mixed with the wheat so either of the way we can grow this then india has largest area and highest production of mustard so it is not only having the largest production and it is also sold in the largest area so both are highest then come to next sesamum so here we can see the figure of sesamum it is mainly a rain fed crop in india so wherever the irrigation facilities are not there we can grow this sesamum then linseed so here we can see the linseed so linseed has a unique drying property and is suitable for manufacturing the paints varnishes and printing inks so remember the use of this linseed and then the castor seeds are present here so castor seed comprises 50 percent oil and it is mostly used in industries friends for all these so it is like the rain fed crops so in any temperature and climate which is dry and which is hot and even if it is not so fertile we can grow all these in those areas then come to next millets so friends here we have three kinds of millets that is the ragi jawar and bajra so here in this figure ragi is present here then jawar is here and bajra is here so apart from ragi ragi is a round granule like thing you can see here but the jawar and bajra they are very similar to maize so maize is yellowish and and the shape of it is very similar to a molar teeth but here for jawar and bajra so the color and shape they are almost similar but they are not exactly similar to that of maize so we can say these jawar and bajra they are the local varieties of maize as such 
and then the temperature is 27 to 32 degree celsius again a very high and the rainfall 50 to 100 centimeters so all these are the characteristics of a drought region and they can be grown in inferior alluvial or loamy soil so even in the inferior soils it can grow and jawar we can say it is a crop in madhya pradesh rajasthan and maharashtra region and bajra we know that it is a staple food of rajasthan and ragi so basically in the meeting place between western guards and eastern guards so ragi is grown so these are a few facts on millets and friends millets are also considered as the poor man's food because they can be grown anywhere then the coffee and tea so the climatic conditions for coffee coffee plants require a hot and humid climate with temperatures ranging from 15 degrees celsius to 28 degrees celsius and rainfall 150 to 250 so it is very similar to tropical so that is why coffee is grown mostly in south india where we have the tropical evergreen type of climate and frost snowfall high temperature above 30 degrees celsius so all these so they are not at all good for coffee and that is why in case of high temperatures coffee is always grown under shady trees so here we can see how in the shades the coffee is being grown like this so the big trees they provide the shades like this and then the dry weather is necessary at the time of ripening of berries so here dryness means not absolute dryness comparatively less and stagnant water is harmful and the crop is grown on hill slopes at elevations so in the hill slopes there can never be chances of stagnant water because water flows down so that is why hill slopes are very much conducive for growth of coffee then well drained loams containing a good deal of humus so all these so basically for coffee and tea we require the best quality soil if we remember that it is more than sufficient then cultivation so karnataka contributes 54 percent of coffee and then kerala 19 percent tamil nadu 8 percent so mark this 54 it is a very huge then the tea crop so tea grows in a moderately hot and humid climate so here the temperature should not be as hot as coffee and also not humid as that so a bit less so that means so how do you feel if you put the ac to a mild extent in a tropical climate so the same climate is required for the tea cultivation and temperature within 13 degrees celsius and it might also go up to 28 degrees celsius and then temperature above 32 degrees celsius is unfavorable for tea plantation friends because here tea means it is not the seed of the tea we are plucking it is the leaves of the tea so if there is no proper photosynthesis so the leaves will not be productive and it is also disastrous to have low humidity so humidity should also not be very less and in india the temperature in winters is below 12 degrees celsius and that's why most of the tea crops they will go to winter dormancy so during winters no production of tea will happen then the acidic soil with around 4.5 to 5.5 ph is most suitable so remember acidic acidic means you should have more irrigation okay so well irrigated and well replenished soil is required then come to next jute so the interesting thing about jute grown is that fertilizers and pesticides are barely needed so it can grow in a very hot and humid climate but with enough amount of rainfall and the soil should be very much wet and it should be drained on a daily basis with huge amounts of water so that if we have so jute can be cultivated so especially in the delta regions of ganga brahmaputra jute cultivation is going on then they are subjected to retting after the stems are harvested from the plant whereby they are submerged in slow running water for 10 to 30 days in order to allow bacteria to dissolve the gummy material holding the fibers together so here we can see how they have been dissolved and they are being taken up and the jute is ready here and we can make textiles out of it and then after this in a method called stripping the non fibrous matter of jute is scraped off and then the fibers are separated by beating with a paddle stem so with the bamboo stems these are being beaten up and the fiber is being prepared and then the conditions for cotton cotton is a tropical or subtropical crop grown in semi arid areas of country so just like sugar cane so cotton is also both tropical as well as subtropical and only light rainfall that is 50 to 100 cm is preferred but however this cotton is not a rabi crop it is a karif crop so we will discuss why then the cotton can also be cultivated under the irrigated conditions and it requires high temperature and bright sunshine for its growth and hard frost is injurious to cotton cultivation and it requires at least 210 frost free days 
for better growth. Friends, this frost free days, it was given in the 2021 prelims. So if you read the whole NCRTs, only in cotton we have this frost free days. So that is why UPSC just wants you to read a book. So any book for that matter. And if you read that thoroughly, so you can answer their questions. So it is not a by heart exam. It is just a knowledge oriented exam. And then the black cotton soil is preferred. You know that the regur soil. So that regur was also present in 2021 prelims. And it is a Karif crop and requires six to eight months to mature. So friends here, this is not a fruit we are plucking up. So this is the seed we have to pluck out. So we have to allow for the fruit to dry and then for the fruit to burst out and then the fibers to come out. So that means you take some six months for the growth of the fruit. So just like any other crop and then again two to two and a half months for the drying of the fruit and bursting of the seeds. So it is an eight month crop. So eight month crop should happen beginning from the monsoon only. We cannot begin from the winter season. Hence it is a Karif crop. So remember that and also the frost free days. So it is like if the frost comes and sits here, so whole cotton will be spoiled up. So this is how the practical approach should be needed while studying. Then the distribution of automobile industries in India. So here we have some of the location factors. So first is the raw materials that is the steel, then non-ferrous metals and then window glasses, then plastics, rubber, wood, then paint, textile, etc. And then automobile industry tends to be located near iron and steel producing centers. So basically because all these metallic parts are made up of iron and steel in automobiles. Then the proximity of tires factory, then storage battery factories, then paints and other ancillary industries. So they are also important for the location. And if you look at the map, so here it is like Rupnagar, then Sonipat, Delhi, then Gurgaon, then Alwar, Lucknow, and then the Jabalpur, Jamshedpur, then Pitampur, then Odav, and then Pune, Satara, then Hyderabad, Mumbai, Batavias, then Bengaluru, Mysore, and Perambur. So friends, when you do this distribution, so initially keep as less as possible. Don't club with so many centers, so many automobile centers. So learn at least seven to eight and slowly build up your knowledge over and above those eight. So go step by step. Don't bite more than what you can chew. Then continuing with the port cities. So ports are also very much important. And here the government policies and cheap labor. So they are also necessary. Then come to next, the location of pharma industries. So here also we go with the factors. That is the Indian domestic market. So that itself is a huge market. So wherever market is there, so in all those areas, we can construct industries. Then in global markets, so Africa is a big market. So that is why most of our pharma industries, they are located in the Western coast so that we can export to the African nation as easily as possible. Then the government policies, we have 100% FDI and we have the clear thought process regarding evergreening and compulsory licensing in the Indian government and then the infrastructure. So here availability of power, transport and market factors and then skilled laborers. So here not the layman laborers, the skilled laborers are required because it is pharma, not automobile industry. Then raw materials. So proximity to petrochemical hubs. Friends, petrochemicals, these are one of the major ingredients. So one of the active pharmaceutical ingredients. So that is why this is an important factor. Then capital availability. So here also the big investments are required for the pharma industry. Then coming to the distribution. So as we have discussed, most of the pharma industries, they are located in the western coasts. Okay. And apart from that, we also have in Baddi, then Barotwala, and then in Bandara, then in Hyderabad, Vishakhapatnam, Chennai. So these are some of the pharma places. So remember as much as possible, need not flood your brain with so many facts. Then the SEZ and NIMZ. So SEZ, so Asia's first EPZ, that is the export processing zone was established in 1965 at Kandla in Gujarat. And then the Special Economic Zones Act was passed in 2005. And by that time, China had established an SEZ. And India's SEZs were structured closely with the China's successful model, that is the Shenzhen model. And then presently we have 379 SEZs and out of which 265 are operational. And 64% of these SEZs, they are in the coastal areas. So that is in the coasts of Tamil Nadu, Telangana, then Andhra Pradesh and others. Then the board of approval is the apex body and is headed by the Secretary Department of Commerce, Ministry of Commerce and Industries. 
and then baba kalyani committee so that was constituted by ministry of commerce to study the existing scz policies so this was pretty bold but however for scz's this is the only one and the unique one hence better to remember that then the nimz national investment and manufacturing zones are one of the important instruments of the national manufacturing policy and nimz's are envisaged as the large areas of developed land with a requisite ecosystem for promoting world class manufacturing activity and then the present status so far we have three nimz that is prakasham in andhra pradesh and sangareddy in telangana and kalinga nagar of odisha then come to some of the differences between the scz and nimz so here under the national manufacturing policy in 2011 nimz was established but scz was established in the act that is the special economic zones act for nimz minimum area should be 5000 hectares and for scz so it is 10 to 1000 hectares depending on the sector so it is flexible for scz then maximum area is not specified in nimz for the scz it is 5000 hectares then income tax exemption is given to the small and medium enterprises in nimz but in the scz so 100% for the first 5 years and 50% for the next 5 years so that means this is an early bird offer so who comes first for them the tax concession is given and then the environmental impact assessment so here this eia is provided by the state government for the nimz and for scz the project developer he gives the environmental impact assessment so these are some of the differences then come to next cage aquaculture so department of fisheries government of india earmarked the investment targets for promoting cage aquaculture under the flagship scheme pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana and what is this cage aquaculture it is similar like whenever we culture the fishes in the river so there are always chances that these fishes flow down with the water and the fishermen incur heavy losses to avoid that a cage will be built up as shown in the figure like this so these will be floating and this area will be acting as a cage for the fish to live and thrive at this region and this helps the fisherman not only to catch the fish easily but also avoids the fishes from flowing down with the river water so a simple concept but yet it is a very crucial one then the happy cedar friends in the wake of stubble burning so zero tilled farming then happy cedars so all are being in news so here it is like how this happy cedar actually occurs say for example here we have the stubbles in the field intact so stubbles are not removed and even the plowing has not been done but small grooves will be constructed so these grooves will be done by this happy cedar plow and within these grooves we will sow the seed so that is the zero tillage farming and once we sow the seed so the upper particles so they will die and decay and the seeds will germinate and now new crops are grown within these older dead and decayed parts so that means it is an in situ management of crop residues within the field so this is how the happy cedar works and the zero tillage farming so that is nothing but again the happy cedar here we can see so not so bigger grooves but smaller grooves are been dug by this plow and some of the benefits that is it avoids fertilizers because the dead and decayed parts themselves they act as fertilizers then it reduces soil erosion and also cost reduction that is the cost for plowing and others are reduced then come to next protection of plant varieties and farmers rights act so here the ppvfr act 2001 has been enacted in india for giving effect to the trips agreement and the act also had strong provisions to protect the farmers rights in that agreement and the act allows farmers to plant grow and exchange and sell the patent protected crops including the seeds and only bars them from selling it as the branded seed say for example i purchased a branded seed in that we will be having the brand of pepsi like this so pepsi mohaiko munsanto so all these are the mnc's working in this agriculture sector and now if i grow a crop from this seed so i can use the crop i have grown for the next sowing but however i cannot rebrand these crops i cannot put a sticker or seal again and i cannot sell it in the market so if i do that so it will be a criminal offense so i can store this for the future sowing or i can consume this or i can sell it in the market as a normal seed and not as a branded seed and it recognizes three roles for the farmer that is the cultivator role breeder role and the conserver role so as a cultivator farmers are entitled 
to plant back rights. So that means I can store this seed and I can plant them back. Then as breeders, farmers were held equivalent to the plant breeders. So for example, I can breed, I can use this variety and I can bring other variety and I can cross breed these two. And then as conservers, farmers were entitled to rewards from the national gene fund. So I can preserve my seeds and I can use it for further cultivation. So these are some of the facts regarding the PPVFR. Some of the plants and animal diseases like the white fly. So friends, here we have the white fly. This had damaged so many maize crops in Bihar region and others two to three years back. And here white fly resistant cotton variety has been developed by the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And it is developed as a transgenic cotton line, which is resistant to white fly. So it is transgenic. That means it is a genetically modified crop, which is resistant to this white fly. And then we have the JD vaccine for farm animals. So vaccine developed and commercialized for John's disease. So JD means John's disease. So that affects sheep, goat and cow, etc. So here we can see the John's disease. That means it starts with the dysentery and the dysentery creates infection here and this unhygienic condition. So that sustains the dysentery and slowly the bull or cow, it weakens and one day it dies down due to undernutrition. So for that John's disease, vaccine has been found now. And then we have the Klebsiella aerogenes bacterium. So scientists at Choudhury Charan Singh Haryana Agriculture University. So they have identified this Klebsiella aerogenes bacterium. So here we can see what it does. So once this bacteria infects, so the all leaves will be dead and they will dry up likewise. And the leaves will be transferred into blackish patches. So once the pathogen is found out, we can always find a medicine for that. Then. Come to next, fair and remunerative prices. So friends, FRPs are in use because sugarcane sector, so they are being given these FRPs. How these fair and remunerative prices are different from the minimum support prices. So FRP is the price declared by the government, which mills are legally bound to pay to the farmers for the cane procured from them. So for example, the mills will procure the cane from the farmers and now the government is not procuring them. So the government gives the money to the mills and mill have to pay back to the farmers. So this is the difference. In the MSP, government will procure them and give the money. And FRP is based on Rangarajan Committee report on reorganizing the sugarcane industry. And mills have the option of signing an agreement with the farmers, which would allow them to pay the FRP in installments. So even installments is also possible. And then delays in payment can attract an interest of up to 15% per annum. So if a mill delays the payment, so they have to pay the 15% interest and the commissioner can recover the unpaid FRP by attaching the properties of the mill. So if the mill doesn't pay the FRP, so now the company will be seized and the government will pay by auctioning that company. And then the payment of FRP across the country is governed by the Sugarcane Control Order 1966 issued under the Essential Commodities Act 1955, which mandates that payment has to be done within the 14 days of the date of delivery. And then it has been determined by the Commission for Agriculture Costs and Prices. So remember the same committee decides the minimum support price also. And the FRP is announced by the CCEA, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. So the same announces the MSP also. And CSEP is an attached office in Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. So remember this attached office. So these are some of the facts for discussion today. Then coming to the last part, friends, hats off to the backbone of India who have been feeding us throughout our years, but their life condition is very pathetic now. So most of the farmers, they will retain the bad crops and they will sell the good crops into the market. So bad crops are for their consumption and good crops are there for sale. So this should not happen. So the children of farmers and the family of farmers should also eat the quality food which everyone eats. And moreover, so whenever we speak about the farm indebtedness and the suicide of farmers, so we should think that, so it is we who are indebted to the farmers and not the farmers who are indebted to us. So always the farmers have the right to have a compensation if they have lost the crops. So we will all work towards the betterment of farmers and we won't waste the food, which includes the sweat and blood of those farmers. So all the very best from my side. Good luck friends.